often, when we hear stories about the civil rights movement, much attention is given to events that took place in northern cities like New York, Chicago, and Detroit, or southern cities like Atlanta and Memphis. However, according to Clarence Lang, author and associate professor of African American Studies at the University of Illinois, it is the civil rights histories in the border state cities like St. Louis that offer a clearer window into our nation's long-standing struggle over race. St. Louis has always been at the forefront of our nation's struggle against discrimination and racial injustice. As far back as the Civil War, although considered a slave state, Missouri was split in its loyalties to Union and Confederate points of view. In the words of Clarence Lang, St. Louis was really kind of the in-between city. It's Midwestern in terms of industry and geography, but there is also a very strong Southern quality as well. After the Civil War, the city continued to grow and eventually by 1900, St. Louis had become a vibrant and dominant industrialized center of commerce. Many industries emerged and flourished in St. Louis because of the city's economic dominance in the region, access to rail and water transportation, and central location in the nation. Thousands of African Americans moved to St. Louis during the Great Migration between World War I and World War II in search of a better life. The increase of African American population in St. Louis was an important factor in the city's role in the civil rights movement. Although St. Louis was segregated and had a southern mentality, the city was more receptive to social change than most southern states. With the help of organizations like the NAACP, CORE, and ACTION, the city made significant contributions in the fight against the social injustices of racial discrimination. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. For most Americans, the civil rights movement began in the 1950s, but before the so-called modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s took hold, St. Louis had been on the cutting edge of civil rights leadership in our country. Two landmark United States Supreme Court cases came out of the lawsuits filed in St. Louis. In 1938, the Supreme Court, in the case of Gaines v. Canada, ruled that the state of Missouri must make professional graduate education available within the state for its black citizens. In another case, Shelley v. Kramer, decided in 1948, the court determined that restrictive residential covenants that prevented black citizens from buying homes in the city was not enforceable. Throughout the 1940s and 1950s, Local civil rights organizations and grassroots activists quickly attacked other forms of discrimination in St. Louis through picketing, leafleting, and demonstrating. Compared to many other major U.S. cities at the time, St. Louis had succeeded in making significant social progress in struggle for racial equality. For example, according to an article published by the Missouri Historical Society by the 1960s, while sit-ins were being staged throughout cities in the South, most downtown St. Louis lunch counters were serving black customers. Municipal recreation facilities were open to all. School segregation had ended and several black St. Louisans had won election to the Board of Aldermen, while others were elected to represent their districts and the Missouri Legislature. In 1961, St. Louis had passed an ordinance ending segregation in all restaurants, stores, and hotels. Two St. Louis organizations that played major roles in leading nonviolent efforts against the city's segregationist laws and customs were the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, also known as the NAACP, and the St. Louis Branch of CORE, which stands for Congress of Racial Equality. Although each organization had its own agenda and preferred projects, they often worked together and supported each other's activities. While these organizations made tremendous strides with dealing with racial issues in St. Louis, there was a growing impatience for the slow pace with which their nonviolent, non-confrontational tactics were achieving their goals. 
new leaders using catchphrases such as freedom now and first you must get you must get their attention began to adopt tougher tactics to get their message across in late August of 1963, while over a quarter of a million people took part in the March on Washington organized by American civil rights leaders, St. Louisans were holding a little demonstration of their own. The Jefferson Bank Demonstration, as it was called, is believed by many to be the most significant event in modern St. Louis civil rights history. For many months leading up to the demonstration, Black community leaders had tried to convince local banks to hire black workers for jobs other than janitors. City and bank officials were unwilling to give in to the demands of the black community, so leaders from the local core organization, which included both black and white members, called for a demonstration to be held at Jefferson Bank in order to draw attention to the issue. Jefferson Bank was chosen because it was located close to a well-established black neighborhood and it was the bank at which most African Americans deposited their money. Organizers of the de demonstration hoped they might be able to convince local state officials to withdraw their business and put pressure on the bank to meet CORE's demands. They were prepared to continue demonstrating until the bank had hired at least four black tellers. They were not prepared for what happened next. Attorneys for the bank went to court and obtained restraining orders against demonstrations that would disrupt bank business. The next day, most demonstrators remained outside the bank, but a few sat on the floor blocking tellers' windows. Nineteen demonstrators, of whom were core officials, were arrested and swift swiftly tried, convicted, sentenced, and fined. The excessive jail sentences and heavy fines angered the community. Many people who normally would not participate in civil rights protests became actively involved. They would lie in front of bank entrances, tellers' windows, department stores, city hall, and even the tires of police cars. Hundreds of protesters were arrested. Despite the fact that the Jefferson Bank demonstration did not fully achieve their ultimate goal, they did prove that unity, strength, and determination could arouse the community and its people to action. In 1964, a new civil rights organization called Action was formed in St. Louis. This organization focused its energies on inequalities in the job market and regularly attacked big business for the failure to include black workers in the construction trades, utilities, and other areas of employment. Along with CORE, the group known as Action, played a major role in bringing about civil rights legislation in the workplace. One such example is during the construction of the Gateway Arch. When construction began on the Arch project in the early 1960s, the city civic, business, and government officials viewed it as means of revitalizing the blight downtown workfront area. Many civil rights activists saw the ARCH project as indicative of continuing racial discrimination. Although African Americans worked as laborers at the site, they held no positions in the skilled building trades involved in the construction. During the summer of 1964, members of CORE picketed the old courthouse in downtown St. Louis. On July 14th of that year, two members of CORE, one black and the other white, staged a dramatic demonstration that became legendary in the St. Louis civil rights struggle. While construction workers lunched and protesters gathered for a press conference at the old courthouse, Percy Green and Richard Daly used a ladder to climb 120 feet up the north leg of the arch. There they sat perched on the rungs of the ladder, feet dangling for over four hours while a group of demonstrators gathered at the leg of the arch demanding that the black workers receive at least 10% of the skilled jobs at the site. The incident focused attention on construction contractors and black St. Louisans' long-standing grievances about the racially exclusive nature of the building trades in a strongly unicized city. The protests became part of a chain of events that led to U.S. Justice Department to file a discrimination lawsuit against the St. Louis AFL-CIO Building and Construction Trade Council and four 
of its member unions, demanding equal employment opportunities for black workers. During the 1950s, the NAACP was very active in trying to eliminate segregation in public housing. An agency known as the St. Louis Housing Authority was set up to use grants and loans from the federal government to clear away slums and blight areas and build housing for veterans and low-income families. The problem was that the, public, the practices of the St. Louis Housing Authority ended up promoting segregation and not eliminating it. Separate housing developments were built specifically for whites while others were built solely for blacks. Oh, freedom. One such project designated for black families was the Pruitt Igo development located at Jefferson and Cass Avenues near downtown St. Louis. These buildings, which were completed in 1955, were designed by the famous architect Minoru Yumansaki, who also designed the main terminal buildings at St. Louis Lambert Airport and the World Trade Center in New York. There were a total of 33 11-floor buildings. They all consisted of small apartments, skip-top elevators, communal corridors, and a playground for the children. For many black families that moved into Peru-Igo, it was the first time they had ever had running water and the first time that everyone was able to have their own bed. On the surface, the buildings liberated many disadvantaged people, and for the most part, was the place where people felt safe. I think that the people who were in Pruitt Igo in the beginning, when they were fully occupied and brand new, at that point when they were well maintained, it was a really nice space. And especially coming from a really cramped house that needed a lot of upkeep that wasn't, you know, in the cards for actually happening, moving from that to a really new space where you actually have your own bedroom and things like that was, I think, fantastic. And so I think from the Prude Igo myth, the sense that I got from the people they interviewed who lived there throughout different phases, from the 1950s up until the uh, right before the buildings were demolished, the people who had the really good memories of Prude Igo were the people who were there earlier on. Mm -hmm. So when the buildings were actually maintained, they loved it. But as many of the black residents claimed, the project served as a way for the city to control them. They weren't allowed to have phones or television, and able-bodied men weren't allowed to live in the apartments. So when families moved into Pruitt Igo, the men would typically sneak in during the night after the inspections had been complete. The rule was that no able-bodied men live in who could who were capable of getting a job live in any place for which their family was receiving any financial support mm -hmm. so if they lived in subsidized housing which Pruitt Igo uh, buildings were the father if he was able-bodied could not live with them and so I, I think it, it was a, a policy that they determined just as a way of establishing the criteria of who could live here and thinking well, we'll help the people who are, you know, particularly single mothers um, with children um, who still live with them, we'll help them. But for the families where they just had really low income, even if they had a mother and father and six kids, if they wanted to have that new space to live in, they had to make the decision as a couple to break up um, and not live together. It wasn't long before people started leaving the Prudigo buildings. After a few years of poor management by government authorities, the clean, nice, new buildings began to deteriorate quickly. Before long, maintenance stopped, the elevators no longer worked properly, and trash and vandalism started to rise. The Prude Igo development soon became a place of crime and fear, and in 1968, the Department of Housing urged people to leave. Mostly the issue for maintenance was that the maintenance depended on the tenants being there and paying whatever they were paying um, in rent. Even if it was subsidized rent, they were still paying something. So there hadn't been additional money set aside to go towards the upkeep. So okay. that was the biggest problem. Once Prude Igo was officially shut down, it became home to drug users and dealers. It became an even more dangerous place once gangs started hanging out and occupying the buildings. 
According to one lady that lived in Prudigo, a lot of bad came out of it, but for a time the good outweighed the bad. For some it was a place that represented nothing more than bad memories. In 1971, politicians decided to start the demolition of Prudigo buildings, and by 1976 all of the buildings had been cleared away. The fact that they blew them up after 20 years I think it was a failure probably before then. I think it was a failure that they weren't maintained, that people did, you know, have this wonderful new space that in the beginning was really fantastic, but then after a while it became seen as a terrible place to live, and nobody wants to live in a place that's considered terrible. Um, it's demoralizing for them, and it's demoralizing for the community around it. So I think that it, it, it's a sad ending, and I don't know that... You know, I think there are a lot of different reasons that it w was a failure. I don't know that it had to be, but I think part of the reason it failed was just the stuff that was out of the control of the residents and the builders and everyone else. You know, with the city of St. Louis had a population of 850,000 in 1950, and today it's down to 319,000. And so it's crazy to think that half a million people left the city, and with the fixed border of the city, that just means there's much lower population density, not enough people filling up that space. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. We shall not, we shall not be moved. A tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Looking back, St. Louis has come a long way from the days of slavery and racial segregation. Though still not perfect, the city, with help of organizations such as NAACP, CORE, and ACTION, has made significant progress in working towards social equality for its black citizens. The demonstrations at the De Jefferson Bank paved the way for more hirings of blacks in meaning meaningful roles, not only in banks, but in other businesses throughout the city. Nope. I was born by the river in a the Gateway Arch demonstration helped spur the creation of minority apprenticeship and outreach programs in construction. Despite a continued population decline, the lessons learned from housing projects like Pruitt Igo have contrib contributed significantly to revitalization efforts in downtown St. Louis and its surrounding neighborhoods. Although there is still plenty of work to be done, there is no doubt that the city of St. Louis will always be at the forefront of a continuing national effort to end discrimination and racial inequality in our country.